My name, uh, for the purposes of this evening and within this part of my life, is Alison. There's an anonymity order. Uh, it's there to really protect my family and my children. I had a relationship with a man I knew as Mark Cassidy um, for five years, and we lived together. Officially, we lived together for four of those years, but we really kind of lived together for all five. He virtually moved in to my flat within a, a matter of months of us starting to see each other. Um, I was a member of the Colin Roach Centre, uh, which was an independent, non-aligned political group in Hackney that had members who were anarchists, Marxists, members of the Labour Party. Um, the particular areas of work that I was interested in was anti-fascism, anti-racism, police monitoring and trade unionism. Um, Mark joined a meeting that I wasn't at, but he attended a, uh, a Black Justice campaign meeting that the Colin Roach Centre was supporting, where he met Mark Metcalf and Mark got chatting to him and then Mark Cassidy came along to Colin Roach Centre meetings where I met him and we started uh, an intimate relationship within a matter of, well, probably about six to eight weeks later. Um, I want to start with an anecdote from my daughter who's now nine years old. Uh, I've, we very, very recently told our children um, about this story. Um, but before this time, we settled the claim in November of last year, and as many of you are probably aware, there was a, an unprecedented public apology by the Met. And uh, one morning before I was taking my daughter to school, Helen and another one of the women in the case were on Good Morning Britain being interviewed by Piers Morgan about the apology. And I said to my daughter, I just want to watch this TV thing very quickly before we go to school, thinking that she wouldn't really be interested and she wouldn't really watch it. And it was on, and then she went, Mummy, that's Helen on the television. And I said, oh yeah, yeah, it is. She goes, why is she on the television? Who's that man behind her? And there was a big picture of Mark Kennedy behind her, who is kind of the brand of our story. And my husband came in and said, uh, he stole her bike. <laughs> and my daughter said, what do you mean? And, and I said, well, no, that's not exactly true. He didn't steal her bike. He, he, you know Helen was involved in the McDonald's campaign? Yes. Well, he was spying on her for the police and the police were sharing information with McDonald's. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, he pretended to be her friend and he was actually a spy for the Metropolitan Police. And her response was, how rude. <laughs> and then she said, but mummy, how do I know you're not a police officer? And I said, well, it's more likely that I'm a bit more like Helen, really. And then it was left. And then about two months later, from nowhere, we were going to school, and she said, um, Mummy, you know those undercover police officers? Yeah. She said, did, they, did any of them have children or families with the people that they were spying on? And I said, well, yeah, they did, actually. And she shook her head and said, friends is one thing, but children and families, that's just out of hand. And I tell this story because children feature quite largely in our experience of this. Because there are some women who have had children with undercover police officers, not knowing. There's one woman in particular who, who didn't know until 25 years later. There are other people, other women, who desperately wanted children and through this experience were denied that opportunity because their years of fertility were stolen by these men. And then there are other women like me who've been fortunate enough to go on to have children, but still somehow at some point have to explain to the children what this story is and what happened to us. And so when people say to me, are you over it now? Now you've got your apology, is it closure? Have you put it to bed? And the reality for me is that it, I'm not going to be over it. It's going to be something that I carry with me for the rest of my life and becomes part of who I am. I'm going to show you a video in a moment. Um, and the purpose of this video is originally, it was originally made for quite different reasons for them for this evening. Um, but it was to show the impact of the experience on my life. And this story, and not just mine, but the other women and the other core participants who've, who've reported their stories in the press, this story has been in the public domain now for a while. It's been in newspapers, it's been in Parliament, it's been told in court and it's been told in meetings like this. 
But the purpose of this video, I hope, will show where the story actually took place, which was the intimacy of mine and my family and my friend's home. When, in the 1990s, when I met Mark Jenner in 1995, I was an English and media studies teacher. And because of that, I was particularly interested in video and video editing. And I had a video camera many, many years before most people would have had a video camera. And I had basic editing skills as well. The reason I say that is it's because other people, the other women in our situation, in our case, haven't got this kind of video footage. But it, if they had that experience of being a teacher in that way, or had they, had they had it now, perhaps, I mean, I think now they're a bit wiser to it, the police, but other people would have been able, other women would have similar videos to this. In other words, other people have got the same, other women have got the same experience of these men being in their homes, socialising with their friends, and being in, very central to their lives for many, many years. Our stories are deeply personal, and one of the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit after the video is the embarrassment that I see in people's eyes when they talk to me, particularly men, when they talk to me about this experience. Men seem acutely embarrassed by this whole topic and feel much more comfortable, in my opinion, talking about the infiltration of black justice campaigns, the appallingness of stealing dead babies' identities, the, um, the, the blacklisting, the various abuses, and there's no hierarchy of oppression. They all tell that all of these stories are part of the picture of the Metropolitan Police abuse through undercover policing. But I, I mention the embarrassment because I'm going to show you some very deeply personal home videos. But I'm showing them to you because I want you to understand the level of intrusion and the level of intimacy um, that these operations penetrated. It's eight minutes long, it's just under eight minutes, and it comes from about eight hours of video. So it's really a very snapshot. And Mark Cassidy, as you'll be able to see, was not camera shy. And in my opinion, the reason Mark Cassidy was not camera shy was because he, he never believed for one moment that we would discover that he was not Mark Cassidy, but Mark Jenner. And whilst Mark Cassidy didn't exist, it doesn't really matter who I have a picture of here and who I have video of. So there's a couple of bits of that that every time I see it, I, I'm reminded. The Wanted Man, the lyrics to that Johnny Cash song are, if you ever see me coming and you know who I am, don't tell nobody because I'm a wanted man. <coughs> the splitting of the chair when he stands up, he says, that's our best chair, that. He's so invested in his identity that he believes that's, you know, his family home, when clearly it isn't. And to my grandma, he, he tells her that he's estranged from his mother, which I suspect strongly is a lie. When people see that, one of the things they ask, or one of the things they say, and people who, who knew us together say, I think Mark really did love you, and I think he really cared for you. And until I discovered about three years ago that he was married with three children, I allowed for that possibility. The fact is, though, that we don't know whether that's true. I don't believe that people like him have the emotional capacity in the way that I understand love. But moreover, any genuine feelings that any of these officers may or may not have had for us are actually irrelevant, because they should never have been in our lives. The key, there's... The fact also is that when I watch it, I remember why I loved him and I also know why I didn't suspect anything. And people sometimes say to me, again, didn't you ever suspect, didn't you ever think there was something a bit funny? And although it, it, you know, there were a few incidents that I've talked about elsewhere, about the credit card and how I, bank card and how I found out his name was Jenna and stuff, but I did suspect, you know, and um, I think that shows what convincing a convincing act he put on. If it was an act or however they operated, it certainly, it was, it was very convincing and it was not just me, it was everybody who he met were, were similarly duped. Um, there are a few key issues that I just want to draw attention to before closing. 
One is the issue that I know Harriet's going to talk about a little bit more, but is the police's position of neither confirm nor deny. Because whilst they have, a, have made an apology to those seven of us in the case with whom they've settled, um, they are still maintaining a position of neither confirm nor deny with Mark Jenner and Helen's ex-partner John Dines. And there's been no disclosure. And I applied for a, I, I submitted a DPA request some time ago and resubmitted it and have been told there's nothing the Metropolitan Police Commissioner has to offer me. There's nothing that, I, that they have, that they are obliged to give me. So I am still none the wiser about Mark, why Mark Jenner was in my life, or what information he holds on me, or what information the police hold on me, or why. And without those answers, um, I can't really make sense of those five years, or the subsequent years of searching. In the forthcoming public inquiry, one of the things I want answers to is, is who knew, who authorised it, why was he in my life, um, and who else has been affected. So through our searching and through our detective work and through coming together with various other people, we've managed to establish certain facts about our stories. But there are many, many women and other people who will have been spied on who don't know. And unless we are told the cover names of the officers in these squads, then we're not going to know the scale of these deployments. And that, for me, is essential. The other key issue, which I don't feel has been, um, I think we've raised it, but I don't feel it's been sufficiently uh, brought to light in the public domain, is the institutional sexism of these operations. It seems to me that the attitude of the police, and actually many people who hear about these stories, are that women are dispensable. The, of the officers in the SDS certainly at the time when, when Jenna was deployed, had to be married. They had to be married because the idea was that they would have something to go back to, that somehow they wouldn't turn native or go rogue. Unlike Nick Johnson, the fictional character in Peter Moffat's recent BBC drama Undercover, who is not married. So there's a double deceit going on. So it's not just the activists, the women activists who are being manipulated and deceived, but it's the wives of these officers who had to be there in order to be deployed. They too have been um, deceived and manipulated. It feels to me that women are there in the eyes of the police to be used. They are either there as a target or they are there to offer credibility and cover to these officers. I was somebody who was trusted in our group. People knew who I was and they knew who my family were. My mum worked for the centre a little bit as well. Or we were considered to be a perk of the job. Now, I don't know which of those is the case. Can I just ask that lady who's about to take a photograph? You weren't here earlier, but there are no photographs at this stage. Oh, okay. I didn't know if they'd mentioned okay. you or not. Yeah, it's for me. Are you okay with that? If you block my head out, yes. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, so women are there to be, it feels to me women are there to be used. I have a memory of Mark very early on when our first, one of our first dates in Camden where we were sitting outside a pub and he said the next day, coincidentally, one of his mates from work had driven past and seen us outside drinking that pub and he'd said that I had nice tits. And that kind of that language um, has stayed with me because with hindsight I realised that that person who was driving past was not his colleague from his carpentry firm where he told me that he worked in South London, but was actually another member of the Metropolitan Police. The other thing that we're told sometimes is that it was just a relationship that everyone's been lied to. Um, that's what happens in relationships. There's nothing special there. And not only were our relationships ones with state-sponsored fictional characters paid for by taxpayers' money, but by, by sidelining these experiences as just relationships, the politics and the sexual politics that underpins them is stripped away. And I feel that, again, has somehow been sidelined in some of the discussions about undercover policing. The other thing I want to mention is the damage and the paranoia that I experienced. And standing here, um, and I, I, you know, I'm confident, I'm a confident public speaker, and 
through the solidarity of working with the other woman, women and the legal team, um, I am confident to stand here and speak out. But Mark disappeared from my life 16 years ago and the damage that I experienced and the acute paranoia that I experienced for many, many years has subsided now but is still there. And, you know, I still make jokes with friends about being followed. I'm still sensitive to thinking my email correspondence and my internet and my telephone calls are tapped. But for about three or four years after he disappeared, I was searching and searching and searching for him because I suspected that he was either MI5 or Special Branch. And I was acutely paranoid and seriously very ill. Um, and I had very profound issues, as do many of the women, uh, around trusting new people. And because I still don't know, because they've disclosed nothing, I still don't know about some of those experiences that I had, some of those things that I believe that I saw, some of those things that I believe that happened. For example, a magpie being in my closed bedroom window and my neighbour upstairs having to come, in, come and get it out. There were things that happened that I don't know whether they were coincidences, figments of my imagination, or low-level harassment to intimidate me by the police and to put me off my search. So I want to finish with um, the, the point that I made earlier about no hierarchies of oppression. There are many elements to the Metropolitan Police's modus operandi in terms of their undercover deployment, and I've listed some of those already. But I want to make clear that I feel very strongly that one, of, one experience is no worse than another. So having the, your violation of bodily integrity, is that worse? Is that worse than having your, your dead child's identity stolen? Is it worse than... Is it worse than denied having the opportunity to have a child? Or is it worse losing your livelihood through blacklisting? Or is it worse being spied upon because you were fighting for justice because one of your uh, members of your family was killed in police custody? And I think when people start to imply that one is worse than another, we get into very dangerous ground. But I want to highlight the institutional sexism, though, within, within the whole picture. Because the whole picture is profoundly shocking. So falling in love with an undercover police officer is confusing and disturbing, and it's where the personal and the political intersect in the most profound ways. And although, as I've explained, the betrayal caused me serious psychological damage, I'm also very grateful for the solidarity, the love and the commitment and the comradeship that I've experienced from the women who I've taken out the case with and through our legal team and through our very many supporters. Thank you very much.